Once one of the organizations competing with the U.S. and the aerospace industry, the European Space Agency is considered a giant on the other side of the ocean. But we all know that they can't send humans into space on their own. This has been a huge humiliation for the agency, as well as limited the ability of European astronauts to access the ISS for many years. However, SpaceX has just changed the game in just one private flight on January 18th, providing the ESA with an excellent alternative to alter the current landscape. Let's find out more in today's episode of Alpha Tech. A SpaceX rocket took off for the International Space Station on another trailblazing mission operated entirely by the private sector. This is not only the latest mission in a series of private sector endeavors, but also the first mission of a European astronaut group to reach the space station. The four-person crew on board Axiom 3 includes Alper Getzeravaci, a fighter pilot with the Turkish Air Force who's on track to mark a historic milestone as the first citizen from Turkey to reach low Earth orbit. Also on board are Walter Villaday, a member of the Italian Air Force, and Marcus Wan, who was selected as a member of the European Space Agency's Astronaut Reserve in 2022. While flights like this have become relatively routine for SpaceX, this Axiom Mission 3 is particularly significant. The Falcon 9 flight on January 18th played a crucial role in advancing private commercial services and opened a new door for the European Space Agency, which was facing a period of stagnation. Why is this so significant? First, to grasp this, let's talk generally about the missions of Axiom, SpaceX, and NASA. Axiom's missions are designed to offer flights to the International Space Station to whomever can afford a ticket. The two previous Axiom missions, flown in 2022 and 2023, have carried a mix of wealthy business people and astronauts whose governments paid for their seats. However, Axiom Mission 3 is the first mission in which a government or space agency has purchased all the seats. What's more, each customer hails from a background as a military pilot, an occupation in which many astronauts have gotten their start. Axiom, along with SpaceX, provides an alternative route to space for private citizens and astronauts from nations not regularly involved in the routine crew rotations on the ISS, where staffing changes occur every six months. In contrast to NASA's exclusive $5 billion deal with SpaceX, where the space agency selects astronauts for the ISS crew changes, Axiom offers a more open approach. Axiom's missions to the space station are shorter, lasting only a couple weeks, and seats are available for purchase at $55 million each, allowing private citizens or countries to participate. Meanwhile, the ESA also has an agreement with NASA to send European astronauts on regular rotations within the framework of the space station crew, but this is still not sufficient to meet their learning and exploration needs. ESA is currently paying 8.3% of the space station's cost, and thus its astronauts receive that fraction of the six-month assignment there. That currently corresponds to just four flights from now until the space station schedule retirement in 2030. We don't have so many flights, so we can't give every member state an astronaut, said Frank DeWin, the head of ESA's astronaut office. That's impossible. Therefore, for the European Space Agency and its 22 nations, commercial flights like Axiom's offer a way of getting more Europeans to space and highlighting the mixing of traditional and commercial space programs. This is also, for the European Space Agency, a first step to see how we can move to the post-ISS era, noted Frank DeWin. This is indeed of great significance because ESA, as a space agency, has been in a challenging position in terms of human space exploration capabilities. Have we ever wondered why Europe is the only major power that doesn't have its own ability to launch astronauts into space? In fact, ESA had previously made an effort to develop a spacecraft known as the European space plane Hermes, named after the Greek god of travel. However, due to the lack of serious commitment from European governments and the cooperation with Russia that was signed allowing ESA to use their Soyuz capsules, Hermes became outdated and was canceled in 1992. The absence of a European system meant that the retirement of NASA's space shuttle program in 2011 gave Russia's Soyuz a monopoly on trips to the ISS for astronauts until SpaceX booted up in 2020. 
If we had a European means of access to space during that whole period, we would have been in a much better position, said Thomas Pisquet, a French astronaut who was the first European to ride on SpaceX's Crew Dragon in 2021. But sadly, they haven't been able to do that until now. They focused on collaboration to transport astronauts into space rather than independently creating their own human-rated spacecraft. This has resulted in a notable constraint on the opportunities for astronauts to conduct research on the space station. In addition to the five new full-time astronauts selected in 2022, the European Space Agency, ESA, has a considerable number of astronauts patiently waiting their turn to embark on space missions. It's worth noting that ESA Director General Joseph Arschbacher has previously advocated for the establishment of ESA's human spaceflight program. However, the agency currently faces challenges in launching even its satellites. The retirement of the heavy-lift Ariane 5 rocket in July 2023, after nearly three decades of service, has left a void, and the replacement of Ariane 6 launcher is still undergoing testing, with criticisms for inefficiencies, delays, and a lack of transparency in its development. Furthermore, ESA's lightweight Vegas C was grounded following a launch failure in December 2022. This situation is likely to persist for ESA, combined with a limited astronaut slots on the ISS through an agreement with NASA. Hence, the seats on SpaceX's Dragon and Axiom missions emerge as the best options for them to advance their scientific projects. Simultaneously, it serves as an opportunity for them to refine and establish their own management strategies and policy allocations for space, aiming for greater independence. While they can directly pay in euros to U.S. commercial suppliers, it's not an ideal scenario for them to depend on external sources. Therefore, the crucial issue here that needs to be addressed is investment. The challenge isn't so much of a lack of money or appetite, but the conditions for investment, which are needlessly complex. European diversity, a main source of European intellectual and practical innovation today, as through the ages, also gives rise to varied legal systems, differences in the availability of capital, and tensions between national and commercial priorities. In a healthier commercial landscape, in which smaller companies compete easily for lucrative space contracts from a central space agency, investment would also become easier. And this is exactly what happens in the U.S. with a space development agency and NASA. The agencies say what they want, launchers to put satellites in the sky, for example, and let the private companies duke it out for the right to design, build, and distribute them. In the flames of competition, inefficiencies burn away and the quality of the work increases. The resulting technology is about as good as it gets. This approach has been enormously successful, inviting ever more investment in space from the private sector and shoring up the U.S.'s position as the world's dominant space superpower. The European Space Agency could do something similar. In the understandable spirit of fairness, the ESA invests in each member state an amount more or less equivalent to each member state's contribution to it. A 100-franc investment from France results in 100 francs in industrial contracts for French companies or universities. And this hurts competition. Competition that has proved so successful in the United States and put companies like SpaceX, rather than a European company, in pole position to launch important rockets into space. If Europe is to fulfill its potential to be a space superpower, it needs to consider putting its policy of fairness aside. A strong continent-wide space ecosystem is better for everyone in the long term, regardless of who wins the contracts. The good news is that European innovation continues to thrive, and many of the companies who win U.S. contracts are European, not American. That's all for today's episode. Hope you enjoyed it and learned something new. Please let us know what you think in the comments section below. Your feedback is very important to us and helps us make better videos for you. Thanks so much for watching and hope to see you next time. Bye.